Hi, I'm Mark Madison, the historian at the National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia, and I'd like to welcome you to another in our series of Conservationists in Action. Uh, and today we have an old friend uh, who's coming here to talk uh, about her brand new book and also hopefully a little bit about Rachel Carson. And, and let me begin by introducing uh, Patricia DeMarco. Uh, Patricia DeMarco is a research professor at Carnegie Mellon University and a senior scholar at Chatham University in Pittsburgh. She's also the former executive director of the Rachel Carson Homestead Association and a former director of the Rachel Carson Institute at Chatham University. She spent uh, 30 years in energy and environmental policy in both the private and public sector uh, basically around the world and interestingly enough her most recent book uh, is kind of a culmination of all these experiences it's a wonderful book I've actually read it twice uh, <laughs> called pathways to our sustainable future a global perspective from Pittsburgh so Patty welcome back to NCTC we really appreciate you uh, swinging by to, to tell us about your new book thank you so much Mark <laughs> it's a great pleasure to be here I was thinking back, I think the first time you came out here was 2007 yeah. um, when we had a, a Carson conference and you gave a wonderful talk there and uh, mm -hmm. we've had you back hopefully every year or so ever since. <laughs> it's true. <laughs> so it's been a wonderful We've imposed on you a lot. <laughs> and you've also come to Pittsburgh a couple of times to yes. speak at different Rachel Carson Always Legacy a pleasure. conferences. I have to say. Uh, and to be on my radio show. <laughs> on your radio show. It's great. Mm -hmm. And. Uh, one of the highlights of my life uh, was coming out when you when you put on uh, a talk by E.O. Wilson. That yes. was uh, yes. an amazing confluence, and uh, and there wasn't as close a connection between Carson and, and Ed as we'd hoped. Right. <laughs> Would have been great if there was correspondence. Right. Uh, but I, if I recall correctly, he did mention that he'd gotten a letter from Carson at yes. one point asking about... And he uh, actually said that he regretted that he didn't go to her because she was too ill at that time to travel to him. And he said, well, I was a young, arrogant graduate student <laughs> and I didn't realize what opportunity I was missing. <laughs> but he did respect her tremendously in his writing and in his work. And I know... Um, he has come to mean a great deal to preserving biophilia and biodiversity. Oh, He's yeah. one of the great voices of our time as well. Yeah, I mean, just, you know, your biography doesn't do justice to it, but you are quite an <laughs> intellectual mover and shaker. You also put on that wonderful conference at Chatham, which yeah. uh, the Carson Scholars and, and, and Carson Ayers were at. That was wonderful, too, a great experience. Well, it's one of the things that happens as you get old. You have accumulated <laughs> opportunities to do good things, and I think the thing is to be selective, and uh, now that I've uh, retired from my official functions, I did get elected to public office, but that sort of practicing what you preach to people um, but I find that deleting the urgent unimportant has left a lot of time for things like writing which you really need um, the space to reflect and to focus uh, what you know into something that's useful to other people and uh, so tell us briefly, yeah. just give us an overview, an abstract of, of what Pathways to yeah. Our Sustainable Future is about. Well, you know, I've been teaching sustainability now for like seven years. And the biggest problem I was encountering is making the whole scenario not depressing to my <laughs> students. We appreciate that. Because it seems so overwhelming. And um, as I was getting in depth in Pittsburgh, in particular, we found so many cases where people are out of a sense of moral conviction, especially, mm -hmm. moving into actions that are going in a direction of sustainability in spite of the prevailing uh, backdrop of policy and uh, political um, press. And so as I was bringing such people into my class to speak, I realized when I sat down to write a book that those case studies of people who are taking action um, to do regenerative agriculture in urban areas or do new things with renewable energy mm -hmm. or look at green chemistry solutions. These are the stories that help people visualize what a sustainable future can look like. And you don't go to what you can't imagine. So giving faces and context to people who are actually making sustainability work in their own community in spite of the press 
to go into fossil fuel development for fracking or whatever. Um, that is what will inspire people to go forward. We have a rare opportunity before we delve into the case studies. Yeah. For somebody who's taught sustainability yeah. and has a, a book with sustainable in the title, how do you define it? It's a it's a big word, and, and oh, we use it a lot. And it it's is. a recent word, uh, historically. There are a lot of people mm -hmm. who define it different ways. And if you're an economist, you're going to do it one way, or mm -hmm. if you're a strict biologist, you do it another way. But I still go back to the Brundtland Commission definition that came out in 1985, where they said that you take care of the, the needs of today's generation without compromising the ability of future generations to meet their own needs. <laughs> And that obligation to the future generations is the important part. Um, Rachel Carson was very cognizant of that as well. Um, she was always concerned about taking precaution to protect especially our life support system for the next generation and for generations to follow. Um, so I think that's the way I measure sustainability. You know, it's a balance between the economy and the environment and the social cultural attributes and right now if you had to look at the way things are in the world we have the economy bulging way out of proportion to the other two and in this country in particular where everything is monetary um, in order to have value you have to have money attached to it or revenue attached to it we've lost focus on the aesthetic and cultural values from our environment and our society as a whole. And I think that's what we need to restore is that balance among, you know, all parts. Which Carson talked about a lot. Absolutely. <laughs> did balance. she ever use the word sustainable though, or was that a more I contemporary term? I don't think term? so, but she did talk about ecology mm -hmm. in, you know, in her um, essay to the uh, Kaiser Foundation. Yeah. She talked about ecology, and it was a new field at that time, you know, and she described herself as an ecologist. Is that essay collected in Linda Lear's? It is. Yeah, I, I is. know I'd read it. It's one of the there. last pieces Indeed. there. What's the title of? Uh, Lost Woods. Lost Woods, yes. The so. Discovered Writings of Rachel Carson. Fantastic yeah. collection of her work. Um, I think Linda Lear did a great service because she did so much research and finding those little pearls, I mean, <laughs> letters and... Um, there was a wonderful know. letter about Al Day in there. Yes, exactly. <laughs> that and letters to our agency. Editor. Exactly. Yeah, comments on, on, you know, music that was written. She wrote covers to the, you know, a, a rendition of the sea. It was, I think, an amazing collection of work. Um, I often... If people don't know about Rachel Carson, I often refer that book as their first contact oh. because it includes her essay on my favorite recreation that yeah. she wrote at the age of 14. <laughs> no, it's a charming book. And, and I, I uh, actually, the, the editor of that book wrote the foreword to your book, yes, Linda did. Lear. So there's a clear Carson. Yeah. And we, I promise we'll get to the case studies. Oh, that's but okay. uh, it was interesting. We've been working with some partners on. Uh, Pennsylvania's role in conservation, yes. which is outsized <laughs> for the state. Um, and in fact, your book uses Pittsburgh and its mm -hmm. environs as, as case studies. Um, and your definition of sustainability uh, reminded me very much of Gifford Pinchot's original yes. definition, another son of Pennsylvania, mm -hmm. uh, of conservation, basically, and then maintaining the resources for, for future generations yep. in, in the same condition or better which sometimes people forget. <laughs> well, and the thing that I liked about Gifford Pinchot's approach is that he has so much optimism that the earth can heal. And I agree with that. I think we have to remember that the living earth is a resilient system to a, to a point. Mm -hmm. And if we just stop murdering it, it will recover, <laughs> you know. And we have to be aware that if we help by not damaging it further, we can restore essential ecosystem functions that we depend on for our life yeah. support system. And, you know, on the, controverse, on the converse, if we don't allow the earth to heal and continue destroying the systems that propagate fresh water and clean air, um, then they will reach a threshold by which they don't go back. They go to some different state, uh, a different equilibrium right. that may or may not support life as we know it. The book itself is overall tremendously positive. <laughs> Almost every right. case study um, is a solution that's that's working, um, and it, it, it's it's one of the most optimistic 
environmental books I've ever read. And, well, that and wasn't an accident. <laughs> I, I decided we really needed an antidote because, for example, I went to the climate reality training that um, Al Gore gives, and there were 182 slides. We went through more than half of them before anything positive came up. Well, by that time, I was ready to put my head down on the table and cry. <laughs> right, right. You know, I think especially when you're dealing with people for whom this is not necessarily a familiar subject, mm -hmm. if you, and I, I don't uh, avoid the gloom and doom, I do give situation assessments yeah. in each chapter, but if you don't give people a way forward that they can see as effective and positive, it's hard to attract people into a field as new participants or new advocates when all you tell them is, we're against this, we want to stop that, we want to avoid this, we want to, it's a no, it's a world of no, and that doesn't generate followers and advocates, it just gets, you know, People polarized. Depressed. <laughs> it gets you depressed, yeah. it gets people polarized. If you're trying to find a way to encourage solutions and to get more people working on solutions you have to give them a way to get to yes and they say wow you can do a community garden in a place that used to be a bombed bombed out you know derelict <laughs> building site yeah. and look what they're doing here we've got a 15 acre organic farm in the middle of the hill district that's feeding 200 people how yeah. did that happen <laughs> you know <laughs> i can do that if they can do that there we can do it here maybe you know so trying to give people examples of things that work that ordinary people and ordinary businesses or creative entrepreneurial enterprises have found forward direction. I think that's what helps you build a movement. That's absolutely true. Yeah. Um, you were deeply involved with a, a Rachel Carson documentary, The Power of One yes, Voice. And, and actually, that documentary, uh, fairly unique among the Carson documentaries, uh, floated around a number of our refuges. Really? <laughs> and connections, <Wow>. yeah. <laughs> like Parker River and so on. Yeah. And um, uh, we showed it at our film festival, mm -hmm. the American Conservation Film Festival. Mm -hmm. And what resonated with me is, is the number one feedback we get from the festival is people want solutions, right? Yes. If, we, if we show them a film about uh, marine mammals in danger and so mm -hmm. on, then the, the feedback we get is, well, how do we how do stop we this? And that, that isn't necessarily um, yeah. the function of a film festival. That, mm -hmm. That's challenging for us, but it, it, it's something that's achieved to a certain extent in your book. <laughs> at well, a, a and local I, case I, did, study. I did do a film series with my friend Kiersey Janza, mm -hmm. who is a Finnish filmmaker now, now in America, and she had done 12 episodes on gas rush stories about fracking and she came to see me toward the end of that series and I started talking about how the energy system is so inefficient and based on Victorian age technologies and that there are better options forward and how the sun gives us 23,000 mm -hmm. times more energy than we actually can possibly use and she was going to go back and revisit some of her earlier interviews in the series and found that the people had died or that you know they were, their illnesses were compounded or the whole situation was so much worse and she was getting so depressed. So I suggested to her that maybe what we need to do is not try to stop fracking by showing people how horrible it is, but to show people what they can do instead. And so she's done a series called Sustainability Pioneers, for which I've been the collaborator. And those tell the stories of how people, communities all over the country, all over the world, have taken matters into their own hands. And from Balcom, England, to Saarbrück, Germany, to Colorado, New York, mm -hmm. all over the place, and talk about, even in Pittsburgh, you know, the Passive Solar House story and the Frick Environmental Center story, how people have made different choices that work better. And we find that people resonate better to yeah. the positive stories than to the negative stories. And I, I found similar to your audiences at the film festival. Um, Josh Fox filmed Gasland. Yes, yeah, we and showed that film. Yes, and, uh, and, and he did it in the Soldiers and Sailors Memorial in Pittsburgh, 1,700 <laughs> people, and at the end of it, he got up on the stage and gave his usual rant, <laughs> and everybody boiled out of that stadium just anxious <laughs> to, uh, they were all 
pent up and full of rage and that, all that energy. And I said, I wanted two minutes to give them something positive to do with all that energy because you have to give people a vision of what can be, not just what you want to oppose. Otherwise, you get powerless rage and, and depression. And if you want to empower people, you have to give them something to strive for. And so that's what I decided to do. I said, well, I could give you all kinds of horror <laughs> stories. Heaven knows there are enough of them. But you're going to find those anyway. The media covers that stuff. You know, a gas well blows up. I mean, they just right. had another one where five people died this last Tuesday. Um, they're going to cover that in the news. Right. They're not going to cover the Ujama Collective right. deciding to <laughs> but make... But you do. <laughs> right, because that's ordinary, normal people doing extraordinary things. They're not going to cover Ron Godovic making a vertical axis windmill that runs at five miles an hour wind speed, yeah. you know, that you can make out of all non-toxic mm -hmm. material yeah. from local sources. That isn't going to make news. A lot of, um, a lot of individuals pop up in here. Oh, and yeah. That's very nice and empowering. Um, if you had to pick one, Pick your favorite child, <laughs> uh, but just just one that that really inspired you. Who would it be? I'll tell you. I would say the Neighborhood Nest Watch program. Okay. Um, not just because my family it's a good participated, one for us. but <laughs> but because wildlife. that's where it starts. You don't save what you don't love. And the Neighborhood Nest Watch program, which is a project of the National um, Aviary through the Smithsonian mm -hmm. and the uh, Ornithology um, program there, has been banding and documenting um, yeah. urban, suburban, and rural birds right. for the health of the ecosystems and the migratory pathways that they follow. And, you know, as Scott Whedon's always pointed out so many times, migratory birds are just such great harbingers of the condition of our mm -hmm. earth and our ecosystems. It's a great way to engage people in connecting to the natural world because they're, you can find them pretty much everywhere. Right. And you can connect to them on a very personal basis. And the Neighborhood Nest Watch you know, case study is a description of how that happens, uh, not just in Pittsburgh, but in many places all over the country where that program has been going on for several years now, I think five or six years. And I thought if people can just find a way to reconnect to the natural world and understand that we're part of the living earth, not the man-made built cities earth, mm -hmm. that you would have a lot easier time making some of these policy decisions. So it's a I, nice example of citizen science, too, yes, which it is, is increasingly. Uh, it is. A, a and, and I issue. think that's another place where scientists in the ivory tower have come up with tremendously exciting and interesting stuff. Yeah. But explaining it to the citizenry has been a little bit less um, successful. And I think the move these days to participatory data gathering <laughs> with the technology that you have of remote sensing. Right. I know there's, um, even since I finished this book, the um, air quality sensing process that I described in the Larimer project yeah. has gone much more uh, sophisticated and it's coordinated through Carnegie Mellon University and people have monitors on their back porches that tell you yeah. the condition of the mm -hmm. air today and there's a bad smell in the air mm -hmm. you can report it to the Allegheny County Health Department mm -hmm. and they will respond to you and say oh yes we noted that and we think it's from this that or the other thing and trying to go back to the source so it is very empowering to people um, to be part of that process uh, as a science participation, whether you're banding birds in your backyard or measuring the air quality or looking at the condition of the water that you fish in. Um, I think these things are helping people connect to the natural world and make that understanding that our well-being and our health depends on the health of the environment that we live in. You mentioned something earlier, uh, communicating science yes. to the public, um, and that obviously is one of the goals <coughs> yes. of this book, to explain new initiatives, things people can do, new technologies, mm -hmm. new citizen science, and, and clearly Carson was a great communicator and somebody yes. you have much knowledge Very about. Much. But you also have quotes from maybe 50 other <laughs> people oh, no, in here. about 50. <laughs> and I was... I was 
Uh, wondering if there were other science communicators that helped yeah. inspire you as you wrote this book. Well, I could e. guess, but e. I... E.O. Wilson, I, definitely. Uh, René Dubois, definitely. Yeah. Um, Wendell Berry. Um, I think you don't have to look too far to find <laughs> a lot of really eloquent writers in this area with very different styles. I think what you have to do is want to find out about these things. And actually, visiting the parks, visiting the National Wildlife Refuges is just such an accessible way to have that happen. I've never been to one where there isn't a tremendous amount of interpretive material that help people understand what they're seeing and why it matters. Um, but I think the people that have inspired me the most and the reason that Rachel Carson inspired me so much is that she came to this from a really deeply personal ethical standing. And I think the problems that we're having today are not technology problems. They're not, if we just had better technology, we would have better answers. They're really things that are solvable. We have the solutions, but we don't have the collective commitment and will to make them happen. So it's a matter of how much you care about the next generation, how much you care about the fact that everything that's alive on Earth has the right to exist. And that was something that Rachel Carson never questioned. I mean, I, I would love to give you her, I don't know if you will remember this, but <laughs> We're she, always ready for Oh, she a, was, um, she, she wrote, I'm not gonna be able to find it. She wrote um, about her personal um, conservation ethic. And it was very short, and it was, I pledge myself to preserve and protect America's fertile soils, her mighty forests and rivers, her wildlife and minerals, for on these her greatness was established and her strength depends. And how old was Carson when she, she wrote, wrote that? She wrote that in college. <laughs> yeah, it was, um, it so was probably actually... probably in the 30s, yeah, was it? Yeah, it, yeah, it was before she was famous. Whale, but wow, it was wow. uh, a competition in one of the wildlife magazines or something, and she wrote it as a... a competition entry you wanted to put your conservation statement in but that you know distillation of what really makes us great mm -hmm. you know we need to remember that and um, preserve it for the next generation and for the very well-being of the diversity of species that we share the earth with because we're only one of them and our health and well-being depends on myriad connections with other living things that we may not even recognize or measure. Um, I write a little bit about extinction in here and about the passenger pigeon as an example yeah. and how the whole cascade of an ecosystem mm -hmm. depended on that little bird, you know, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> and yeah. the throngs of them. <laughs> And their influence on the shape of the forest and the, the you know, life cycle of the, of the forest and the land, um, you know, you never know what you're disturbing when you eliminate something. Right. Never mind what happens when you eliminate a whole mountaintop and dump mm -hmm. the contents into the streams. Yeah. You're making permanent alterations in the way the living systems relate to each other. Well, the extinction of the passenger pigeon was certainly one of the causes for what became the National Wildlife Refuge System. And even though the focus of the book is on Pittsburgh, yeah. um, you uh, early in the book talk about one of our refuges yeah. you visited, Chincoteague. Yeah. Tell us what the heck you were doing at Chincoteague. Okay, well, I'll tell you. <laughs> I, I really love the ocean. I lived um, in the Foreign Service like for Carson. many years. <laughs> and I um, actually read Rachel Carson's Sea Around Us while mm -hmm. we were on the boat on the way to Brazil from Pittsburgh. We left from New York and went, and they had it as a coffee table book in in the ship. And um, it was quite amazing. It was, you know, soon after it had been published, and, you know, she hadn't written Silent Spring yet, and I was in fourth grade. And I felt like the connection to the ocean was something that resonated instantly. And living on the edge of the sea for close to eight years of my life at that time was um, something I still miss, you know, because yeah. we're pretty far inland yeah, in Pittsburgh. Yeah, Pittsburgh, you're a little So ways away. when I have time, I go to the beach. <laughs> and because my daughter is in, you know, Virginia, we go to Chincoteague or yeah. somewhere there. And, uh, you know, Chincoteague and Parker River and that whole area along the coast is what I can get to easily. And I feel like you know, 
when you go to the beach with your grandchildren for the first time and they are great beach combers they go all the time to different beaches all yeah. over the world but to go to Chincoteague with them was really special and um, they got quite engaged with digging up the sand crabs. And I bet. I finding, bet. finding. We went and sat in the, you know, in the little um, enclosures and watched <laughs> the herons come and feed. And it was um, a really special place. And I had the great joy of um, going there with Lou Hines, uh, who was the director at that time. And he had been to speak in Pittsburgh at one of the conferences mm. that I gave and invited me to come. And um, he personally gave me the tour that you wouldn't have um, as just a member of the public. And he said, well, we're going to go as before the bridge was built, the way Rachel Carson would have seen oh, yeah. this place. And so that was really special because even though the, the black flies were unbelievable or whatever, <laughs> I can were, imagine. the green flies, <laughs> I mean, we were netted and screened and barely got out of the car. But... Um, we went from the place where she would have landed and drove back through the pine lolly forest yeah. uh, along to the edge and then we walked once we got to the edge of the beach and he showed me how the swales of greenery were between the trees so that they made little havens mm -hmm. in between he said this is what caught her eye for refuge area because the migratory birds would have grass and shelter and safety right now, maintaining it in that condition is the art of the matter, yeah. and um, it doesn't just happen and stay that way because it would evolve right. over time. The other thing that I found very dramatic at that particular expedition was there had been a storm the previous summer, and looking at how the untouched, undeveloped part of the shore where the park is and the refuge had fared compared to the part where they had put houses all the way down almost to the edge of the water mm -hmm. and had put riprap and tried to stave back the sea with right. no success um, and to just see the function of the coastal land and the marsh and the wetland you know the saltwater marsh areas and how they actually rolled with the storm and were much less damaged that was quite dramatic as a contrast. So I think if anyone really wanted to see the value of storm preparedness, um, to just look at how the wildlife refuges in the coastal areas have managed that issue, and you would find no question at all. I wonder if Carson ever wrote about that. I don't, I don't know if she did. Yeah. Um, I know she wrote about um, Madame Musket, uh, Madame Musket has Yeah, Madame Musket, yeah. I haven't been to that one yet. Um, and certainly her conservation one. in action papers wrote about these areas yeah. in, in very eloquent and great detail. And I'm so glad you have them on your website. <laughs> I, send my reading. Anybody, I send my students anybody there can read all them, the time. Google has put them on their yes, books thing yes, yes, and then they're great. available to all. And they're, they're really wonderful, even though some of them are a little dated in terms of what people would see there yes, yes. and why right. they would. Like duck hunting isn't exactly the focus of everyone's trip. No, and the Shinkatee one I think might have been written before the bridge. It was, it was, <laughs> so the, definitely. the directions are a little <coughs> off. Yeah, the directions today. are off. But, but the prose is still The prose timeless. is unbelievable. And, and I think to just get people to be sensitive to the fact that if you go to places like that and just open your eyes and shut your mouth, <laughs> you, know, you can encounter, you know, things that wouldn't normally, you know, enter your consciousness. Well, you mentioned going there with your grandkids, and that ties back to a, another early chapter in your book, and that's about trying to connect people to nature, yeah. and especially young people to nature. Why, um, why do we care if young people are connected to nature? Well, you know, kids today spend a lot of time on their electronic devices, and they can tell you about the Serengeti and the... Uh, polar bears mm -hmm. and they can't tell you what's in their own backyard or their own neighborhood. Um, partly it's considered not safe. A lot of people don't consider it safe for their children to be outside. Um, you might have, you know, no one to introduce you to the natural world. You don't go outside for recess, you know, and you live in a built environment where you go in your car from where you live to where you go to school yep. and where you shop and you don't wander around and have wild places to explore. And 
it's it's really tragic <laughs> and I think it makes it difficult to maintain a policy where you're preserving you know clean air fresh water fertile ground and biodiversity if people have never experienced those things and don't understand where they come from I know I was giving a series of lectures at the Rachel Carson Homestead Times in the various sixth grades mm -hmm. throughout the Allegheny watershed yeah. um, and I talked to one little class and I asked them where their food comes from we were talking about food safety yeah. and um, they all said well it comes from the grocery <laughs> store you know yeah. okay well okay say you buy eggs where do the <laughs> eggs come from and some of them had no clue uh, they'd never seen an onion in their native state you know really? and I, I just feel like what kind of people are we raising who don't understand where their food comes from or where you get water you know yeah. and how can you have a society that preserves itself on to generations if everyone thinks that it just sort of happens and the things that make our life support system are not valued in the economy. People get upset when they have to pay for water. They get <laughs> agitated, you know, when you run out of energy. What falls on you for free, we don't value. What you pay us some for and yeah. pretend to own somehow has value and prestige. It doesn't make any sense. Carson talked about this, obviously. Oh, yeah. A sense of wonder. What, yeah. what can we do today to connect young people to nature? Well, you know, make sure they have time to go outside and just yep. poke around you know I mean it, it there are lots of places that have neighborhood parks and if there aren't you should make sure you have some and certainly the national parks are open to everyone most of the state parks are open to everyone mm -hmm. um, they need advocates and they need people to use them um, I think finding a way to have something living in your environment you know even if it's a window box or a flower pot you know where you can have some connection to the living world it's really important to develop that sensitivity the biophilia as yeah. they call it you know uh, that reminds us that we are living organisms dependent on the living earth um, the more we can reinforce that concept of connectedness to the living earth, the better off we're going to be. Are there examples of that in Pittsburgh? Were there well, you know, Pittsburgh is a biophilic city. And, <laughs> Do you uh, want to tell people what biophilia means, okay. just in case they haven't biophilia read Neil Wilson means, or Steve it Keller? The, it means the love of nature, and basically it's an essential characteristic of humanity, is yeah. that you are... A, you are in love with life and in various forms um, even little things like ants and butterflies and uh, whether or not they have economic value they have a right to exist and they have aesthetic and existential value as fellow creatures of the earth so Pittsburgh is a biophilic city it is and they're trying to expand the tree canopy uh, to 60 percent by 2030 from its current 42 percent now that's helped a great deal because we have so many steep hillsides where buildings are not really possible yeah. but uh, we're trying to reconnect to the rivers and um, make those places where you can actually walk instead of having them walled off, you know, um, industrial transport centers right. and um, making it easier for people to bike and walk than just drive um, and having neighborhood parks in every neighborhood. And we also have some really spectacular national treasures in Pittsburgh, one being the National Aviary, mm -hmm. which is unbelievable as both a teaching institution and also as a place to visit um, people come from all over the world to go there and um, Bob Mulvihill is the chief ornithologist there and Steve Latta they just did great work um, and are great teachers both of them <laughs> and the other is the Phipps Conservatory yeah. and Botanical Gardens um, which has built a zero net facility the sustainable landscapes facility as a teaching place and also as an office space and has been an inspiration all over the area all over the world as a living building not mm -hmm. just a green building but a living building standard and now the Frick Environmental Center has done the same so 
and the entire Eden Hall campus of Chatham University, which was Rachel Carson's alma mater, has put a campus together that follows that same model. So it's beginning to infuse out even into communities. Yeah. Uh, my borough has put up a new borough building and it's a net zero energy borough building. We just moved in last week. <laughs> actually in the middle of a 10 degree weather <laughs> event right. when they were moving boxes in and out as soon as they closed up all the doors it was wonderful and it's a <laughs> geothermal heat yeah. system with passive solar design and a photovoltaic roof so it made economic sense to do that and people are beginning to recognize more and more that you know having things that are compatible with a living system are also economically viable you describe uh Pittsburgh is a, a case study for a global perspective. Why yeah. is Pittsburgh a good choice? Well, you know, you've had our mayor um, being a major protagonist in the Paris Accord, but we're also a global trade partner. We have a lot of um, global companies who come in and out of Pittsburgh. Um, we are an internationally recognized university. Many of our universities have campuses elsewhere in the world, and uh, we are a center of innovation and thought and have been for a long time. Um, University of Pittsburgh was attached, uh, uh, founded in 1787. Yeah. So we've been, you know, on the map as a center for innovation for a long, long time. Now for many years when I was a kid, yeah. Pittsburgh environmentally was known as a, a hotbed for pollution. It is. <laughs> and then, uh, um, but in your book, you, you suggest some ways that there's a pathway yeah. To be, uh, to well, it still <laughs> it still is a hotbed for you know argument about air quality because the way the land is, we're mm -hmm. in a valley and it swirls up from the Mississippi Valley over the western part you know of the country through the middle and up through Ohio and down and then it tends to swirl around yeah. in that valley, so it will concentrate things that come all the way across. So it's become a bellwether for um, some of the legacy industries uh, still operate. We have coke works and um, chemical facilities and so forth in our city. And so the air quality index is a battleground. And, you know, but it seems much cleaner. It I've is. I've been going there the last... When you day. look at it, it is a lot cleaner. Uh -huh. But you have fine particulate and you have not visible volatile organic material, especially from the fracking industries that tend to cause issues. And so people are, you know, in uproar over mm -hmm. that. And we have regular confrontations with the health department hearings. And, you know, the issue over hydraulic fracturing has become very hot in Pennsylvania. Mm -hmm. um, it's one of those transition issues where do we want Amazon or do we want chemicals <laughs> that make plastics? And you can't have both. And if we do have both, one or the other is going to suffer. And, you know, people are beginning to recognize that we do very much, you know, have two roads forward and they're not equally fair, as Rachel Carson puts out. Yeah. <laughs> Her fable for tomorrow, I mean, we are there, very much so. You did describe some very interesting, and you alluded to the, the windmill, some very yeah. interesting new energy initiatives. Tell yeah. us about some of these, because a, a lot of them were new to me. I really? <laughs> Well, you know, uh, Ron Godovic is um, uh, an entrepreneur, a serial entrepreneur, and he uh, decided that Pittsburgh is the place to manufacture things because it has a long tradition and a yep. trajectory. He's made a policy of hiring veterans mm -hmm. because they've been trained well and often have trouble finding work. And he wanted to make a commitment to do things that were not toxic. and. He makes windmills on the Savonius principle, so they go this way instead of this way, and um, operate at very low wind speeds, like five miles an hour and up, and they have their own battery pack in the base. Oh. So you can put them, you know, they had one installed on top of the city market for a while. Um, they have several on the waterfront. Um, the um, Epic Metals has, uh, I think, six painted with their corporate colors, mind you. Uh, and uh, also a photovoltaic roof. And so they're finding ways to integrate these um, into remote locations. He has provided them for a number of frack sites <laughs> where they need a remote power, yeah. power supply, but they're portable. 
so you can take them where needed and ship them around. And they're also suitable for locations that don't have high velocity wind to be effective. That's really interesting. So that's interesting. a really cool innovation. I've never seen a windmill <laughs> like that. I mean, yeah. did, was it his idea or is this something that was used in, in It's old, periods? actually. The Savonius <laughs> windmill, I forget what year it, it came to be, but um, it, it's been around for a long time. Um, and I think the the beauty of it is that you know I don't know if you can see it but um, we can hold it up and <laughs> can maybe it, it can uh, <laughs> but here it is I, I mean it's here, a, it's a, it goes around um, yeah and the thing is you know you you can put these in places that um, ranks of large you know, arrays of windmills wouldn't work, um, like on tops of buildings yeah. or uh, along uh, water edges or along streets, along the rail lines, you know, anywhere where you have wind. Um, I think... Are they safer for birds? Well, they are because they don't... They <laughs> they're going slowly. They don't have blades and they're yeah. like interlocking semicircles. Huh. So they're like cups. You think of a, a series yeah. of cups that catch the wind from any direction and uh, they don't they don't tend to shred things up. I mean, the day that we went to the residential installation that we visited, Kiersey and I went and filmed one. Uh, there were birds sitting on the struts. <laughs> that seems <laughs> were, like it's more friendly. <laughs> yeah, it was. It, it isn't an issue. You know, they are also not as tall necessarily, yeah. unless they're on top of a building. But even those kinds of large-scale, you know, utility-scale windmills. Um, if you look at bird impact compared to mountaintop removal, for example, where you're destroying entire habitats yeah. without any hope of recovery, um, as opposed to intersecting individual, you know, creatures. Um, certainly siting considerations can make a big difference in how much impact a wind system will have on, you know, bird migrations and yeah. so forth. So, One of the things I didn't expect to see in a book focused on Pittsburgh was a discussion of agriculture. <laughs> oh, there's a lot <laughs> Tell us of a little about the, the new Ooh, agriculture. There are two or it. three things about agriculture. One is there are a lot of food deserts in cities. Mm -hmm. And some of the response... Maybe you better define okay, that too, just in a case. A food desert is a place where the people who live there do not have access to a grocery store okay. or food supply other than, say, for example, convenience stores or something right. that doesn't provide a full array of options. Yeah. And uh, a number of these kinds of places have looked at growing some of their own food as a proactive. Yeah. Uh, and you can either do it like the Ujamaa Collective did as a situation of, well, we have a way to take this into our own hands and you build raised beds and you start putting compost in them and mm -hmm. you start growing vegetables and then we can feed people. Um, and other places where people decide there's a vacant lot here, we're going to make something grow here and we use it as a teaching tool like the YMCA yeah. did and like Larimer did. Community gardens are springing up everywhere. Uh, the city of Pittsburgh even adopted an urban agriculture organ ordinance huh. under the um, tutelage of Shelley Danko Day where they established a way to make it legal to have um, beehives chickens yes always a controversial three, issue <laughs> and up to three miniature goats really <laughs> in in the city yeah as opposed to being livestock banned right you know and um the um, um uh south side flats which is part of it is uh, on the front of my book is the south side um they have done uh, a community garden that is on city-owned land where they lease out plots to people they have a waiting list you know, of people who want a plot. So right. looking for more spaces where you can reclaim either vacant lots or places where buildings have been abandoned and are now being triaged, and you can add green space. They don't have to be big. There right. are some that are really small. Um, there are some that are, you know, several acres, mm -hmm. you know. But finding a way to bring the concept of um, agriculture back to Pittsburgh. Sure. This is not a new thing in Pittsburgh because in the days when I was a child, uh, back in the early 50s and the 40s, right after the Second World War, sure, after the, the Victory, Victory Gardens. The Victory yeah. Gardens were there before exactly. because so many people who live in Pittsburgh were peasants from the old <laughs> country and they came here and they farmed. 
and, and we didn't know we were poor because we <laughs> ate like kings and we yeah. had illegal chickens under the porch, you know. And, you know, we grew every square inch, you know, of that little quarter acre that yeah. we lived on and we fed, you know, all of us and the five boarders that lived in the basement, you know. I mean, it was just what you do. So there is a tradition of that and those little pockets you know, if you drive around Lawrenceville or Larimer or Homewood, there are places where people had gardens. Some of them were paved over to make parking areas, but a lot of them are still gardens. You look over the back fences and they may not all be growing food anymore, but they can, and yeah. many of them do now. That was a great chapter. I it's enjoyed great that. And fun. it did remind me very much of the Victory Gardens where everybody had a, a little true. bed in their backyard. It's true. And, you know, I think this is another thing about empowerment is... Nobody wrote a rule that you have to do this. This was a patriotic expression. If yeah. you grow your own food, there's more for the soldiers. Well, now it's more a self-preservation thing. If you want to know what you're eating and have good, fresh stuff, you can grow some yourself. And look at this. It grows in Pittsburgh, and you can can things. There's a huge resurgence of putting things by for the winter. We've given a good overview of your book. So... <laughs> As we, as we come near the end, it's time to ask a nutty question. <laughs> it's related to Pittsburgh. <coughs> One of the other things most of us think about Pittsburgh um, is it's uh, a very uh, sports-oriented um, uh, town. And one of the things that occurred to me in reading your book is are there any athletes that are environmentalists or speak up or help you with these projects? Uh, there are I honestly some, don't know. It's a not, genuine they're question. Not, um, they're not real outspoken in my finding. I know there have been some that have set up foundations uh -huh. uh, for um, uh, helping <coughs> people come along, but I don't know of any right now yet. That it's are. the next frontier. Well, <laughs> you I mean, really want to influence kids and so recruiting. on. Wouldn't it be yeah, great if, if somebody from the Steelers or the Penguins yeah. or the Pirates? Well, they do <laughs> try, you know, the, the new Penguins um, uh, place is supposed to be energy efficient, but see, they're supported by... As befits a team named yeah, after a South yeah. American. <laughs> but they are, um, you know, they're funded by a lot of the heavy energy industries. And so they're not real outspoken about environmental issues. But the new penguins, arenas, yeah, they are. There, there's a place that's you know in process, and that's oh, well hopefully going to be that's a good helpful. Sign. And the um, Heinz Field has tried very hard to increase awareness of things like pollution. Mm -hmm. A lot of the times that they've had concerts there, and the plastic is unbelievable that's left behind. Yeah. So increasing awareness of that kind of thing and using. Um, renewable systems in the buildings at um, you know the parks has been a priority of the mayor as well but it, so there's it's still frontiers to be tackled yeah, and <laughs> but it does seem like a, a way to tap <coughs> into great communicators yeah. that might not have this on their agenda we never think of asking athletes to yeah to speak well out sometimes you do and the the uh, organization isn't you know in that direction yeah. very much <laughs> that's true you know. who's the audience for this book both well, the audience you found already and the one you, you yeah, seek to find. I have found that um, a lot of people who are interested in sustainability and want to know what to do, mm -hmm. uh, I give a lot of speeches and people say, well, what can I do? You know, and I like to have something I can leave behind and say, well, you know, there are a lot of things you can do, but there's a whole array of them and you can find the one that works for you. And yeah. this gives you a way to see some things that have been tried that are working, you know, in at least one place. Um, there are a lot of sustainability books out there that say the best of or best practices or their right. anthologies of things. And you get little slices. But I wanted to give a sense of the struggle. You know, it's a back and forth. I yeah. mean, we have a you know, history of fossil development and very deeply entrenched in our culture and um, the pride of that history sure. is not something you want to throw away, no. but you want to have a platform to move forward from that. And showing that back and forth, I think, is important yeah. for people to understand. Well, once again, Pinchot called it the fight yeah. for conservation, yeah. one of his more famous books. Yeah, and I also find that people who are teaching, um, I like to use case studies in yeah. my teaching, and bringing them in to talk to people is fine, but you can't always do that. Right. So having a place where you can read case studies of different 
kinds of applications. We, we deal with energy, we deal with regenerative agriculture, we deal with green chemistry, yep. which is we a new field. <laughs> we didn't. Yeah, we, and it's a thick book. Thing. We can't get to everything. See, it's a lot the of richness other thing. in here. You never can cover everything that right. you want to talk about. So having a book that looks at these things um, gives you a way to you know use it. I've used it for courses. And in fact, um, most of what's in here came from the seven years that I taught science, ethics, and public policy. And, you know, different semesters we would take different topics. So I had 15 lectures worth of material, at least, <laughs> for each of these topics. Oh, I bet. <laughs> so, you know, I could talk forever about any one of them, given the least bit of provocation, but that isn't very productive. But also, um, I wanted to have a place to raise some of the questions about the barriers to change the institutional barriers part at the end, I think, is really important because we're very much at a point where we have to decide mm -hmm. which way we want to go. And the question that Rachel Carson posed in her fable for tomorrow is very much upon us today. And I think she definitely had a very clear idea where we're going. I want to, want to read that little bit. That might be a you. good way to go out. Okay, if you wouldn't mind. Sure. Um, this is Rachel Carson's word. Mankind has gone very far into an artificial world of his own creation. He has sought to insulate himself with steel and concrete from the realities of earth and water. Perhaps... He is intoxicated with his own power as he goes further and further into experiments for the destruction of himself and his world. For this unhappy trend, there is no single remedy, no panacea. But I believe that the more clearly we can focus our attention on the wonders and realities of the universe about us, the less taste we shall have for its destruction. I can't think of a better way to end, Patty. And that is what inspires <laughs> me about Rachel Carson, and I thank you so much. And I think that's the message of your book, so once again, yes. thank you. Yeah. I'd like to thank everybody who tuned in. Uh, this has been a wonderful talk with thank Patricia you. DeMarco. Her book is called Pathways to Our Sustainable Future, A Global Perspective from Pittsburgh, and uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Mark. It was fun. This is fun.